Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Viewers, this is the fourth episode of the 19th topic. In the previous three episodes, we have discussed certain verses of Surah Qiyamah and the interpretations of these verses as well. We have seen how, in the view of Imam Hamiduddin Farahi, a very distinguished scholar of the subcontinent, these verses spell out the whole scheme of the collection of the Quran. We had also seen how well grounded his views were vis a vis the linguistic style and construction of the Arabic language. And then we had seen how history uh, also corroborates his view vis a vis various details. We had also taken a look upon the traditional interpretation of these Surah Qiyamah verses and seen that uh, the, basically it's uh, Ibn Abbas narrative which explains this, uh, these verses of Surah Qiyamah and which are exegetes like uh, Nijarir Tabari, <coughs> uh, Ibn Kasir, Samakshri, Razi, Abu Jafar, Tusi. They have taken uh, this narrative to be an explanation of uh, these Surah Qiyamah verses. However, the explanation offered not only suffers flaws in its uh, text, the way it has been uh, described, but we can also, we have also seen that uh, this explanation also cannot be reliably ascribed to Abdullah ibn Abbas himself. There are certain flaws uh, in, the, in, the, in the chain of narration which make us realize the fact that uh, this is all, in all probability this is incorrectly attributed to him. This explanation is wrongly ascribed to him. Then we had seen that although the Quran gives us a principal statement in this regard that the Quran, uh, once it was revealed in various installments, it, sh it shall be brought together in a unified whole by the Almighty through the Prophet. Uh, but the Quran stops here and does not tell us how this will happen or what would be the medium. We had then seen in the last episode that uh, if we look at the various uh, details in which the Quran was found in the living tradition of the Muslims. It was read, read out, memorized, written, heard, and recited and taught. Uh, we, we had concluded the fact that the Quran, although it was not left by the Prophet in the form of a, of a book, of a codex, uh, of an officially compiled codex, yet it was transferred to the Ummah in its uh, oral capacity in a, in a unified, as a unified whole. And then uh, a, lot of, a lot of companions had also memorized, uh, not only memorized, they had written their own copies of the Quran as well. So the Quran was found in the living tradition of the Muslims, both in the written form and in the oral form. And it was transferred by the Prophet to his companions, who were basically students, who then transferred this, uh, this document or this text to later generations. But as far as a written codex is concerned, or a complete written book format, uh, document is concerned, this never took place uh, at the official level. So this was as far as we had covered in the last uh, three episodes. Now uh, viewers today in this episode we shall take up some questions which arise or which may arise in the minds of people vis-a-vis uh, -vis the view we have established or I have endeavored to establish as the correct view in the interpretation of the Surah Qiyama verses. And uh, these questions are actually based on certain narratives. Uh, which are found in our uh, hadith and history anthologies, they seem to contradict the view uh, which Imam Farahi has actually posited and he has demonstrated how the Quran itself has, uh, has told us that the Almighty, once its revelation is complete piecemeal, it was, it was revealed piecemeal in over a period of 22 years. Once this would be complete, the Almighty will bring it together and then arrange it afresh in a new sequence and then this new sequence will be read out to, to the Prophet and he would be required to abandon the previous sequence and he would be required to adopt and adhere to the new sequence with the new recital. So uh, if this is uh, the conclusion which Farahi has drawn and which we have seen in our previous episodes, it holds a lot of uh, convincing uh, aspects as well and we had also seen how history corroborates this uh, view of uh, the Quran, uh, then as I said, we will, we will have to look at certain narratives which seem to contradict uh, this view of the collection of the Quran, which of course is something which the Quran itself has, uh, has stated. Uh, I have already uh, taken a look at all the narratives that I am now going to just uh, briefly discuss before you in a lot of detail in the previous episodes. So uh, almost on, in 80 plus episodes I have taken uh, a, a detailed look at each and every narrative which uh, which actually I'm going to discuss now 
and which seem would seem to contradict uh, in some form or the other the view that we have just formed on the basis of the Quran. So for details, uh, our viewers are advised to look up the respective topics, uh, which I'll just also briefly refer to. You can just look up lectures on those topics for more details. But today, here in this episode, I'm just going to briefly touch upon those narratives which seem to contradict and then give a brief uh, answer or a response and refer you to those previous talks. So those who are interested in detailed talks regarding the rebuttal and ref refutation and critical appraisal of these narratives, they can look up uh, those uh, talks and those who would content themselves with this brief uh, description or uh, re refutation of the narratives can of course uh, just uh, adhere or stick to what is being uh, said today uh, before them. So uh, let me start off. There are primarily uh, 14 narratives, I would say, and as a result, 14 questions uh, which arise on this uh, view of the collection of the Quran on Farahi. And there are 14 narratives which I would say seem in one form or the other or in some way or the other contradicting uh, Farahi's view that I have just uh, alluded to. Let me uh, take, up them, uh, take them up one by one. Now, the first of these views, viewers, was discussed under topic 15, and that is the incompleteness of the Qur'an. Uh, we had actually discussed two narratives, in specifically two narratives, one of them concerning the stoning verse and the other one uh, relating to the suckling verse. And we had seen, uh, in, in, while, uh, while I was evaluating uh, topic number 15, this was discussed under topic 15, that both these verses uh, which give us the impression that the Quran we have is incomplete, uh, they have their own explanations that need, we need to understand. Now as far as the stoning verse is concerned, we find there are two types of, we had actually discussed two types of narratives. One of these narratives actually explicitly uh, cites that verse, a shaykh wa shaykhatu iza zaniya farjumuhuma, which is famously uh, al which famously translated uh, translates as the married man and the married women. If they com commit adultery, then they should certainly be stoned to death. This was the stoning verse. So there is one category of narratives in which the stoning verse is cited in these words. And then there's another category of uh, these narratives in which it is just referred to without actually citing these narratives. So we had seen in that uh, in, the, in those talks and uh, discussed on the topic 15 that as far as those narratives are concerned in which this uh, stoning verse is, is cited uh, they are uh, they are extremely weak in the description and uh, to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and also the questions which arise on the text of these narratives and the, on the text of this verse had also uh, shown that uh, these narratives cannot be accepted uh, and as far as those narratives are concerned in which the stoning verse is just referred to and not actually cited by uh, its by the words we had seen that they have they can be explained by the by the uh, view of farahi himself who has uh, who has actually posited the fact that uh, these uh, verses which refer to the stoning verse actually are a corollary of this of the 34th verse of surah maida in which the punishments of Hiraba are mentioned, or punishments of uh, rebellion and uh, uh, and spreading disorder in the land, fasad fil ard, are mentioned. And he had shown how certain criminals of gu guilty of adultery, certain criminals, not all, certain criminals of uh, guilty of adultery, had been punished by the or, by by the prophet in accordance with this verse, which says that they should be uh, brutally killed for their heinous crimes. And one of the words which were used. Uh, in that verse was taqtil, which means to to uh, to kill someone in, in, in an exemplary way, and storing to death is, is actually that uh, that particular manner in which uh, some some uh, criminals guilty of fornic of adultery had been punished. So it, that particular uh, those particular narratives had been explained as well. That if, although they do not mention uh, the uh, the stoning verse, but they are actually referring to what. Surah Maida's Quranic verse has al already uh, stated, and therefore there is uh, there is no question of the fact that the Quran we have is incomplete, and the the notion which these narratives give is also incorrect. Now, as far as the suckling verse is concerned, uh, we had seen that uh, the suckling verse actually is reported by uh, Aisha, uh, and from from her it is actually Amra who reports, and she says that among what was revealed in the Quran was that ten known suckling drops make a person prohibited to marry, and he makes that person a foster ch uh, foster child. Later, this was abrogated by a verse which said that 
five drops actually are sufficient to make a person a foster child and therefore prohibited to marry. And then the verse, and the, then the hadith goes on to say that God's messenger died in the verse which mentioned these five drops was among what was being read from the Quran. So it says, فَتُوُفِّيَا Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa وَهُنَّ فِيمَا يُقْرَوَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ So this actually gave us the impression that the Quran that we uh, have is incomplete because this hadith is actually saying that this uh, five drop verse of foster age was found in the Quran at the time of the Prophet's death. But of course it is no longer there. And we had seen how Imam Tahawi had actually pointed out how this uh, is actually rebutted by the fact we have, that we have another version uh, or a more sound version again reported by Aisha and from her it is actually Amra and it uh, clearly says that these five and, f uh, and ten and five drop verses were revealed but uh, they were uh, among those verses which were actually abrogated which had been actually totally repealed. So uh, we can see uh, in, in the light of this explanation that as far as the incompleteness of the Quran is concerned in particular regarding these two verses uh, which, uh, give the, which actually tell us that these two verses were left out from the Quran and not present in the Quran, they had uh, been explained while we were discussing topic number 15. That, let's move on to the next question. The next question actually relates to a narrative which we discussed while we were, we were discussing the, the second topic and that is that it seems from a narrative that only four people, all of whom belonged to the tribe of Ansar, had collected the, time, uh, the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. And so there were certain explicit narratives which explicitly said that no one except these four have collected the Quran in the time of the Prophet and there were certain implicit ones as well. We had seen in our discussion on topic number two that uh, as far as the explicit uh, narratives were concerned, all of them uh, were very, very weak and suspect in their description to the Prophet. And as far as the implicit ones were concerned, though they too had some issues, but primarily we need to understand first of all that as far as the word collection here is concerned, uh, it uh, in all probability refers to memorization and not to a written collection. We had seen how various va variants of this narrative point to the fact and the usages of the word point to the fact that the word jama actually here refers to a, a collection, a, a memorization of, of the Quran. So this would actually, of course, uh, contradict many other narratives which tell us that there were people among the Muhajirun and other tribes who were also memorizers of the Quran. And uh, this particular narrative which tells us <coughs> that uh, only four people had memorized the Quran from the Ansar would then contradict uh, those narratives. Also views of importance is the fact that it is difficult for any person to make a list of all the memorizers. He can at best say what, uh, whatever came to his knowledge. So either we have this option of rejecting such narratives which contradict other narratives or we have uh, uh, another explanation which I had presented before you which seemed very plausible and that was the one which was offered by Hafiz ibn Abdul Bar, uh, and he had actually uh, told us that basically uh, these, this, these narratives have become devoid of certain background details and uh, narrators have cut short this uh, narrative and reported it the way we fi find it in uh, Imam Bukhari's al Jami al Sahih. Uh, but as uh, Ibn Abdul Bar has pointed out in al Istiyab, he says that there, uh, there was a certain background uh, which, we can, which we can see in some of the other narratives which he had pointed out, which told us that actually uh, this was nothing but a scenario in which a debate of superiority or a Nazarite as we call it in Arabic would, uh, was, would, would usually take place between, between the tribes of the Aus and the Khazraj who were both Ansar tribes. So the Khazraj tribe actually while expressing its superiority had said that we have four memorizers of the Quran amongst us and in reply to that the Aus said that okay we have other people who, who can who counter your claim to word superiority. So it was basically a debate between the two Ansar tribes uh, which is found in detail in other narratives which was cut short which was reduced in its background and what remained was that only four people had uh, memorize the Quran amongst the, uh, amongst the Ansar in the lifetime of the Prophet. Whereas, as I said, actually, it was a debate between the uh, between two tribes of the Ansar, in which the Khazrajites and the Ausites, if I may say, were engaged in uh, in expressing the superiority of uh, one another over each other. So, whereas it was just a debate of uh, superiority between the two tribes, 
And hence, we can clearly see that uh, the, fa the claim that only four memorizes of the Quran, as is claimed by this narrative, again, is something uh, which is uh, wrongly uh, interpreted because, as I said, we, have not, we, we know in this regard what the details are. Here is the third question uh, which, uh, which arises or as a result of these narratives um, is a group of narratives which is actually found in Ibn Nadim's Al-Fahrist and in Suyuti's Al-Itqan and which if you recall we discussed while we were taking up, uh, we were taking up the sixth topic uh, in discussion and that is that we find that certain narratives ascribe uh, a s different surah arrangement to the uh, codices of Abdullah ibn, of uh, Ubay ibn Kaab anhu, and Abdullah ibn Masood anhu. We had seen that they are, uh, they, the surahs are differently arranged, uh, not only um, from uh, between themselves, the two companions, but also from the Quran that uh, we know uh, is with us and which was compiled as per uh, uh, the Quran's own specification in the time of the Prophet himself. So ha they have an entirely different surah arrangement. Uh, but we had seen viewers that the way they have been reported, not only the questions which arise on the text, but also their ascription uh, to these authorities respectively are, is extremely frail. And when, when we were discussing to topic number six, I had pointed out the flaws and therefore uh, this fact cannot be entertained. And the reason that this actually is important is that it is on the basis of this particular, one of the basis I would say is that people say that because of the fact that companions had surahs arranged differently in their codices, therefore the arrangement of the surahs of the Qur'an was something which took place in the times of the, Us of the, times of the Caliph Usman. As far as the verses themselves are concerned, they were arranged in the time of the Prophet, but the final arrangement of the Qur'an took place in the time of the Caliph Usman. And uh, before that, we had different uh, surah arrangements as, is, uh, as, as they contain is the case that can be seen from these uh, companion codices and uh, I had uh, posited the fact that these uh, narratives actually are extremely weak not only uh, in the text they report but also uh, in, in the chains of narration and, and we had also seen a number of contradictions in this regard as well. Because the fourth question then that arises is uh, actually also based on a narrative which says that Abdullah ibn Masood who is, was a very, is a very famous authority and a very close companion of the Prophet. Uh, he did not regard the last two surahs of the Quran, which are of course Surah Falak and Surah Nas to be part of the Quran. Now, the answer to this question also, viewers, uh, which I had given in detail, and this was given when, when I was analyzing top, topic number seven, was that actually uh, it is wrongly attributed uh, to Abdullah ibn Masood that he did not regard uh, Surah Falak and Surah Nas to be part of the Quran. What in fact what did does seem uh, probable and plausible in the light of all the material, if we analyze it, uh, uh, which is available, it comes to mind that the question which actually arose in the mind of Abdullah ibn Masood was whether the word Qul with which these surahs begin is part of the surahs or is it a command which actually Gabriel gave to Muhammad sallam, that he should recite. The word Qul means recite. So uh, the, the question which arose in the mind of Abdullah ibn Masood was whether Qul A'uzu bi Rabbin Nas is this the, or Qul A'uzu bi Rabbil Falak is this the wahi that, uh, that makes the surah uh, the first verse of the surah or is it just A'uzu bi Rabbil Falak A'uzu bi Rabbin Nas because the word Qul is only a command from it can be construed to be a command from Gabriel. So the question that he had in mind was that, that perhaps the word Qul was uttered by uh, Gabriel himself as a command to the Prophet and the Prophet then had to say A'uzu bi Rabbil Falak. So this is, uh, this is a question that Medellin arose in, in his mind and which, has, which took the form of these uh, narratives uh, ultimately taking the shape that perhaps he had rejected the Quranicity or the Quranicness of these uh, two surahs. Now, use the fifth uh, question which arises vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the view of Imam Farai is that uh, we find there are narratives uh, which tell us that right after the death of the Prophet, uh, Ali Anhu went about collecting the Quran from various fragments. Now, these narratives are mentioned both in Sunni and in Shia sources. We had discussed both these sources in detail when we were discussing topic number five and we had found 
that they, these narratives are not only uh, reported in a very weak manner and they, have, uh, they are not reliable as far as the description is concerned, but there are a number of questions and contradictions which arise on their text as well. And what at best can be adduced to use is that Ali Zala who had perhaps uh, c collected a personal uh, copy for himself or he had written a personal copy for himself the way other companions and students of the Prophet uh, did so. As far as the details are concerned, the way they are described in Sunni and Shia sources are cons uh, are in, in them, they are totally unreliable. Thus we have uh, the Sunni account which tells us that Ali Rita who compiled the Quran, its chronological revelation or chronological sequence and uh, upon being asked by Abu Bakr Anhu that why he is actually uh, delaying his pledging of allegiance to Abu Bakr to himself as the Caliph and Ali replied that since additions were being made in the book of God so therefore he uh, took apart himself to, uh, to, to collect the Quran and since the, the, the arrangement of the Quran was being tampered with so this was something which occupied him and, uh, and as a result he gave preference to this task so we find Abu Bakr uh, to have expressed his satisfaction of the of, in this delay by Ali Ta'ala Anhu and the Sunni sources are silent after this but as far as the Shia sources are concerned they tell us that uh, Ali Ta'ala Anhu actually uh, had brought over the Quran he had collected uh, right after the death of the Prophet uh, brought the uh, codex to the to the companions who said that uh, they already have uh, the Quran with them and therefore they would not need the Quran which Ali has brought. At this Ali actually angrily went away and he said that he would never see the Quran again. And there are some other accounts which say that the Muhajirun and the Ansar initially did not have a copy of the Quran. So when Umar became the Caliph, he actually requested Ali to give them the copy so that he could uh, make more copies of uh, those, that Quran. But Ali refused and at this, uh, at this we see that uh, uh, Umar was frustrated and he um, embarked upon collecting the Quran with the help of two witnesses. So this is how the Shia account tell us. Uh, so viewers, we had seen, as I said, that in the, in those uh, in that while we were discussing uh, topic number five, that this uh, Shia account and the Sunni account, the way have been, they have been described in our books, they suffer from uh, flaws which make them absolutely unreliable. And the only thing which at best at best can be gathered as an educated guess is that Ali actually went about preparing a personal copy of the Quran for himself and that is all. Right. The sixth question which arises uh, is uh, actually the one that we discussed while we were we had taken up topic number three and that was that uh, right after the uh, of the demise of the Prophet, uh, some time after the Prophet's demise, the battle of Yamama took place in which a lot of memorizers of the Quran were martyred. And uh, this alarmed Umar Anhu and he came over to Abu Bakr Anhu and requested him to have the Quran written down and compiled in a book form and lest uh, with the passage of departing or dem demise of other memorizers who were engaged in fighting other battles, the Quran might be lost. So Abu Bakr, although he first hesitated, but then he was convinced and then it, uh, Zayd ibn Sabit a young person at that time uh, in his early 20s was selected for the task of collecting the Quran from various fragments so that he could compile it in, in the form of, of various suhuf. Uh, I had shown while we were discussing topic number three that the questions which arise on the text of this narrative and they, the way it has been reported because there are certain other secondary narratives as well uh, which have been recorded by Ibn Abi Dawud in his Kitab al Masayf telling us that the collection was made in by with the help of two witnesses. So we had seen that how these the primary narrative, which does not mention the methodology of a collection, but the and as well as the secondary narrative, which which mention this methodology that two witnesses were employed in in making or deciding about uh, Quranic verse. Both these types of narratives suffer from uh, flaws, which make them unreliable. And we had even seen that uh, there is the personality of Ubaid ibn Sabak who narrates these narratives from Zayd ibn Sabit and it is extremely unlikely that he would have heard this narrative from Zayd ibn Sabit. Uh, our earliest uh, Rajal authorities in Muhaddis soon do not even know who Zayd ibn Sabit, uh, who uh, Ubaid ibn Sabak is and in, in all probability this narrative is munkata, it's broken. But and, uh, of course there were other flaws as well in this narrative and uh, uh, those who are interested to look about, who want to more details uh, regarding the critical appraisal of this narrative can see uh, the talks that I 
uh, I had uh, delivered when I, when I was discussing topic number three. We have the seventh question, which uh, arises is because of the narratives which uh, report that Usman Anhu in his own times actually uh, faced this scenario in which Muslim armies were fighting in the, in the fronts of Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, at, it is reported by one of his generals, Josefa ibn al-Jaman, that uh, Muslims actually fought over each other over various uh, readings of the Quran. By reciting the Quran, there were differences, serious differences between the Muslim armies when they were uh, gathered there uh, fighting the enemy. And they had differences over reading the Quran. And this alarmed uh, Huzaifa, who reported this matter to Usman, who was the caliph at that time. And then Usman summoned uh, the copy of uh, Hafsa, uh, of Abu Bakr, who was actually resided at that time with Hafsa, uh, who was uh, the Prophet's wife and the Caliph Omar's daughter. And he then made copies and then had them distributed to the various uh, areas of his empire. And he, it's also, there are also certain other narratives which actually said that he went about collecting the Quran afresh. He did not use uh, Hafsa's Musaf and he just made a copy of the Quran. Um, he made a collection of, of the Quran, a fresh collection of the Quran. So I had shown viewers that uh, these narratives also do not hold ground and they are uh, very weakly reported. Where I, as I said, when I was discussing topic number four, and uh, we had seen how history books actually negate the fact that there was any uh, dispute between the Muslim armies uh, uh, in reading the Quran. What is more established from history is that there was a dispute regarding the spoils of war. Some narratives say there was a dispute regarding the leadership between the two armies, the Syrian and the Kufan armies. But uh, the fact that the earliest uh, history books tell us that there was no such dispute as reading the Quran is very, was very apparent. I had shown that to you. And we had seen that in this regard, perhaps what can best be gauged by, when we gather all the material in this regard is that Usman actually uh, destroyed certain spurious Messiah which must have uh, been present, especially uh, some, uh, some of them which might have the chronological revelation uh, of the Quran uh, or some of the verses which were uh, in the chronological revelation uh, present and he destroyed those and he also embarked upon as a responsible caliph in disseminating the Quran and in uh, having it uh, spread out in various parts of his empire. So that is all that he did. He perhaps destroyed certain spurious messiahs. He had them, some of them written afresh as well and then uh, he sent them to various parts of his empire and by doing this he actually set right the, the uh, arrangement if it had been tampered with by, by certain uh, people and he had also set right the consonantal text of the Quran and he had also perhaps removed any abrogated verses had they been present in certain spurious messiahs. So basically Usman's endeavor, the way it has been reflected in our narratives is again very questionable but perhaps what actually happened was that he went upon destroying certain spurious messiahs and also in disseminating uh, the copies of the Quran far and wide to his empire. This is all that happened as far as the transmission of the Quran is concerned. It went on in the oral form uh, that the way it was uh, received by the, the first generation of the Sahaba and this inshallah we shall also take up uh, when we uh, take a look at the transmission of the Quran in the, in the next and the final topic. So uh, this as I said was the seventh question and this we discussed while we were uh, discussing topic number four. Here is the eighth question which arises uh, and which also was discussed when we were discussing topic number eight is that Usman actually exercised his own judgment in placing the two surahs of the Quran together and they are respectively Surah Anfal, the eighth surah, which formed the eighth surah, and Surah Tawbah, which forms the ninth surah or Surah Bara. So it is said that actually Usman exercised his own judgment uh, while he was uh, having the Quran copied in his times and he placed them together not because he had any guidance from the Prophet or uh, from, uh, from any divine means but because he himself thought that the two are related to each other as far as their topic is concerned. Uh, and again, this is one, one of the reasons that uh, there are authorities and our scholars who believe that the uh, arrangement of the Quran as far as the surahs are concerned was something which took place in the times of Usman. And one of the reasons, besides the reason that I earlier pointed out vis-a-vis -vis the companion codices which had a different surah arrangement, is this narrative as well in which Usman is reported to have exercised his own judgment. Now, while I was discussing this topic in, uh, in, my, in my own uh, detail, detailed talks, I had shown how weak this narrative is as far as its text and its chain of narration is concerned and nothing at all can be deduced from it. So that is, uh, in my opinion, 
the, uh, the final word in this regard that this narrative cannot be accepted. The ninth question viewers that arose, that arises I would say is that uh, we find that uh, there were certain or different, certain variations in the copies which Usman sent to uh, in his own times to the Muslim Empire. Now, uh, while I was discussing topic number 14, I had shown how, for example, in Abu Ubaid's uh, Fazal al-Quran and some of the other books, uh, we find that the there existed variations in the copies which uh, Usman had uh, sent. And we had also seen how um, these variations were accounted for by our traditional scholars as uh, the fact that since the Quran had variant readings, or, and therefore these were incorporated in various uh, copies instead of incorporating them in a single copy they were incorporated in various co in various uh, uh, copies which were sent to the empire and i remember i had counted them to be 60 there were 60 variations but viewers i had also uh, analyzed that such is the, such was the trivial nature of these variations for example between a wa and a fa uh, very small variation that these at best can be regarded if they were if they ever existed to be um, oral or scribal errors on the part of the of the scribes, they they cannot be, they are not absolutely, they cannot be grounded, uh, well grounded and well argued that we take them to be variations which were actually by by willful um, uh, intention placed there because we find because one thought that there are variations, we had, we see had seen I had shown in my humble capacity that all these. The variants, they are weakly ascribed, their chains of narration are weak and they have questions and flaws. But what best can be gathered if they are to be uh, disregarded, these, uh, this, this chain, these, the flaws in the chain of narration, then they were just oral, oral I would say, uh, and scribal errors uh, which might have existed. But uh, in no way can they be regarded as variations which were willfully uh, inserted. Uh, and uh, readers can look up topic number 14 for more details because they were discussed very comprehensively at there. Here's the 10th uh, qu uh, question which arises um, is again on the basis of a narrative and this was uh, also discussed in, uh, incidentally in topic number 10, on the topic number 10 and that was that actually uh, Usman when he when the when the copies of the Quran were brought before him, he actually looked on those copies and he says he said that he remarked actually that I see errors uh, in these copies, uh, and then he said, okay, the, the Arabs would uh, would rectify them by reading them, and he, the word that he uttered was lahan that there are mistakes in the Quran, but as I said uh, in my when I was analyzing topic number ten that these uh, narratives are also very weakly ascribed and they have the questions, but if at all any explanation can be made is that perhaps Usman was not referring to any mistakes. What he was, he was actually referring to is that there were certain letters that were wrongly written in certain Masaif and since the transmission of the Quran heavily re relied on the oral medium, uh, Usman said doesn't matter if these mistakes, these scribal errors are there. Uh, they, they, they have been written wrongly, but we know from the old tradition, the strong old tradition, that how they are spelled, how they are actually uh, pronounced. So even if, it, if, if, even if you leave them alone, it would not matter because the strong oral tradition would take care of this, these uh, wrong, uh, erroneously uh, written words. And I also pointed out ex examples which Dani himself actually gave, and Imam Dani himself actually has given this explanation that perhaps this is the most plausible explanation that uh, the alif or a ya or a wa at times have been inserted at uh, in certain places in the Quran and they are additional actually. And these have to be regarded as scribal mistakes of course, but they were not of any consequence, they were not even thought of any uh, consequence or, or significance because such was the nature of the oral tradition and such was the nature of these mistakes that one would immediately realize that a wa or a alif or a ya has been, uh, in, uh, has been mistakenly inserted. Thus, for example, uh, we find La uh, Uzabbihannahu in the famous verse of Surah Naml, verse 21. So we have an extra alif here. Actually, it is La Uzabbihannahu, which actually is a word from King Solomon saying that I shall necessarily sacrifice that or slaughter that, that bird. So we have an extra alif here. Then in the word Sa'urikum, which is uh, Surah Araf, uh, one, verse 25, we, we find an extra wa. And then in verse 34 of uh, Surah Anam, we, uh, we find the words bin Naba il Mursaleen and extra ya. 
So basically, what Usman, uh, in all probability, was pointing out was towards these uh, vowels, these extra vowels which has been uh, been inserted by the Sahaba when they had written the Quran. But then, when uh, when the copies were made, he and they were copied the way they were. Usman said, "Just leave them. Doesn't matter if they are still there because our the Arabs, the way they would they know how these words are correctly pronounced, there would be absolutely no problem. So this is how I had endeavored to explain when we were discussing this 11th question in the, uh, under the ninth topic. Uh, viewers, now uh, we now come uh, to, the, uh, to the 11th question. Uh, actually, uh, previously we were discussing the 10th question and uh, uh, that the 10th question was actually discussed under the 10th topic. The 11th question, viewers, that arises uh, is discussed when we were discussing topic number nine. And that is that Abdullah ibn Masood actually refused to surrender his copy uh, to the officials of uh, Usman when they had come to gather it. And the way these narratives report, it uh, clearly seems that perhaps Abdullah ibn Masood had some uh, different version of the Quran with him and that is why he refused to surrender something. And he, he actually said that he had learned or he had uh, uh, he had been taught 70 surahs directly from the Quran and how can he give up something uh, which he had directly uh, learned from the Prophet in, and uh, give it away to the officials of Usman. So this is how these narratives have been reported and while I was discussing topic number 9, I had pointed out that it seems to me that actually what happened was that uh, as we have seen that the Quran was given a final arrangement uh, when it was complete. It was. It also, ha also had an initial arrangement. So the Sahaba are bound to have these both these arrangements with them because initially the Quran was revealed the way it was. It had a revelatory sequence and then there was a final sequence. And it seemed that Abdullah, Abdullah bin Masood, one of the oldest companions of the Prophet, actually had uh, this earlier uh, arrangement with him as well and which he actually thought was a prized possession because he had heard these surahs directly from the mouth of the Prophet. So he actually had uh, he wanted to keep this as a historical record, uh, knowing full well, of course, that this is just a historical record as far as the Quran is concerned. It has been given a new arrangement, and he did not want to give up that uh, prized possession uh, in which he was. Uh, he had his own musaf, in, which was at the time when the Quran was being revealed, and of course, it had, which might have a different sequence, not only in the verses within the surah, but in, amongst the surahs themselves, and maybe it also had certain verses. Uh, which were repealed. But then again, it was clearly a, a historical record with which uh, Abdullah bin Masood wanted to retain with him and he did not want to surrender. But the way these narratives are reported, they have given us an ex absolutely new uh, new form and new picture as if uh, Abdullah bin Masood was insisting on a new Quran that he might have had. Uh, we also know that there are narratives in which Abdullah bin Masood was present in the, in the final review, the Al-Arza Al-Akhira. So he knew perfectly what the final arrangement was because there are narratives which tell us that he was a witness to the al arza al -Akhira. So he, he, was, he perfectly knew the previous sequence, the previous historical revelatory sequence and he knew what the final sequence was. The only reason which seems to me is plausible in why he refused to surrender his uh, codices and also asked the people of Kufa to hide them was because he actually had that original sequence which he knew very well that it would be changed, but because of academic purposes, because of his love uh, of keeping a record of, uh, of the, the previous revelation, he did not want to surrender it. So this, I would say, is the uh, 11th uh, question and the way I would uh, go about answering it. Uh, the 12th question, viewers, is that uh, we find uh, there is a narrative in Abdullah, in Ibn Abi Dawud's Kitab al-Musayf telling us that Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, changed the Qur'an in its times at 11 places. This narrative had been shown uh, in, while I was discussing topic number 11, that it is, uh, it is uh, rejected by all authorities and uh, it is uh, not only uh, has questions regarding its text, but also in its chain of narration, which is extremely weak and extremely unreliable and it seems to be a concocted narrative, but, or uh, at least a narrative which has, uh, which has uh, been reported in a way in which facts have been distorted because if we analyze this narrative in the light of many other historical details, we find it seems that in times of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, as was the case in the Caliph Usman's times, that uh, like Usman took, uh, destroyed many spurious messiahs, it seems that while Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was a, the governor of Iraq or Kufa in his times, he too uh, took upon a massive campaign to destroy a spurious messiah, which he thought was there. And he even uh, as we know, uh, Ibn Qutaybah has recorded 
that uh, he actually constituted a committee of three people, Asim al Jahdari, uh, Najia ibn Rum, and Ali ibn Asma, to destroy all spurious Masayif and pay their respective owners a compensation of 60 dirhams as well. So we find that, uh, and then we have another narrative from Imam Baqilani in his Al Intisar, who, which actually says that the Masayif of Kufa had 11 mistakes in them, which uh, Hajjaj actually corrected. So it might be in all probability that this correction which Hajjaj made in the Kufan codices actually ended up as uh, in, in the form of a narrative which, uh, which depicts the fact that actually Hajjaj changed the Quran at 11 places. Perhaps what happened was he corrected the Quran or the Kufan, certain Kufan codices which were wrongly written. So but this is, might be the real picture but as far as the narrative is concerned uh, which tells us that the Quran was changed by Hajjaj as I said it was uh, it is, uh, totally uh, unreliable and has been uh, wrongly reported. The thirteenth question viewers which arises is that uh, uh, we f uh, find that there are certain narratives uh, reported by for example Ibn Zures and by others uh, in their Fazal al-Quran uh, which tell uh, and Abu Wad as well that the Quran the way it has been arranged it has a certain sequence in which uh, the first there are the first seven long surahs are called the Sabu Tewal, then we have the main surahs then we have the Masani and then we have the Mufassal surahs. And I had shown when I was discussing topic number 13 that not only the connotation of the words Me'een and Masani and Mufassal and even Tewal, uh, the connotation as well, is disputed among authorities. Uh, this narrative itself is extremely uh, weak in its description to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and therefore this again cannot be entertained. The 14th and final question viewers, uh, um, which uh, arises uh, is on the basis of a narrative in the al jamia Sahih of Imam Bukhari, uh, which seems to tell us, or at least uh, there, there is, there are scholars who think that on the basis of this narrative that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself actually left behind a mushaf, a, a proper arranged copy of the Quran, and uh, we have the famous Astuvanatul Mushaf narratives in which it is said that uh, the Prophet would seek out a particular pillar in his mosque where he would offer the optional prayers and that was called the Ustavanatul Musaf or the pillar of the Musaf signifying that a Musaf of the Quran was placed near it and later perhaps withdrawn. Uh, but I had shown that uh, this, uh, this is actually a very wrong description. All the details which uh, if gathered uh, in this regard tell us, and this was uh, when I was discussing topic number 12, that actually this Musaf is, ref this is the one which Hajjaj ibn Yusuf had sent to the Prophet's mosque in Medina in his own times, and uh, which was actually placed beside the pillar where Prophet Muhammad would option offer his optional prayers. So it is th like the details that come to light is that, uh, come to light are that actually Hajjaj had sent a uh, Musaf to the Prophet's mosque in Medina, the Masjid al Nabavi, and had placed it at the at the at the pillar where the prophet would uh, uh, offer the optional prayer, the nafil prayer, and uh, this is uh, these are the details. But uh, uh, it has been erroneously interpreted by certain scholars that actually the ustawanatul musaf means the musaf, the pillar of the musaf, and signifying the fact that this was the pillar, or this was the musaf which was placed at a certain pillar in the mosque of the prophet by uh, by, and it actually is the same musaf which the prophet himself. Uh, had compiled in his own time and he, which, which he left behind and which was in fact later destroyed by Marwan ibn al-Hakam. But uh, you, if you, uh, more details can be looked up when you, when you can see uh, how I have analyzed them when I was discussing topic number 12. So viewers, these are the 14 questions on the basis of these uh, narratives. Each of them, of course, is based on narratives which arise and which I have just briefly answered today in a very passing way. Uh, have done so in much detail in uh, the earlier topics. You can uh, look them up. And uh, finally, I would say before we close this uh, uh, this topic, it's both the nineteenth topic and go on inshallah to the next topic uh, later on. That uh, Farahi's view, the way it has been mentioned and the way it has been presented, is uh, is something which presents a new light on the collection scheme of the Quran. It is as if uh, the correction of the Quran has been. Uh, delineated by the Quran itself in the Meccan period. Surah Qiyamah is a Meccan surah. So much before the final Quran or the final installment of the Quran had been revealed, the Prophet and his companions were, in, were informed, were assured in fact by the Almighty that the various installments which are at the moment necessary, the Quran cannot be revealed in a single 
revelation or a single go because of various reasons. It has to be revealed in episodes, but the Prophet shouldn't worry. All these episodes shall be brought together in a new, a new sequence by the Almighty, and then that new sequence shall be read uh, to him, read out to him, and he would be obliged or he would be obligated to read that, uh, the, read the Quran in, with its recital in the new sequence. And this actually, uh, I was, I would say, is a uh, is a groundbreaking uh, interpretation which Farahi has offered, and it is not only it is very true to the words of the surah, the whole context of the Quran, but also we find history uh, standing uh, at the back. A lot of historical details, I would say, also uh, actually telling us how uh, this mechanism took place uh, in. In, uh, in, the, in, as in the living tradition of the Muslims. So, inshallah, in the next uh, and final topic, we shall see how this collected Quran, the way we have just described, was transferred to the later generations and ultimately how we, as its recipients, stand vis a vis its authenticity. So, until then, Akulu Kali Haza, Wastafirullah Ali, Walakum, Walisar al Muslimina, Wal Muslimat.